I'm indifferent. I'm believing God. To the existence of God is not judging them. I don't have proof. I don't know how to pray. They're judging themselves. You know, where is God in all of this? This is my home. God exists. What does it say about God that he created the orgasm? I don't pledge allegiance to anything. I don't pray. Only to God. If there was a God. And I thought. I just have this understanding that life is hard. He could never love me after this. God is still good. Well, hey there, Maybe God fam. Thanks for tuning in for this interview. Uh, today, uh, we're, we're recording an interview for a future episode of the podcast, uh, an, an episode on addiction. And I've got a really special guest today, a uh, friend, um, up to now a digital friend, mm -hmm. but now a real friend. Real friend. <laughs> <laughs> We've only uh, known each other on social media up to now, mm -hmm. but I've, uh, I've got the real honor of being joined in studio by uh, Russell Dixon, who is a, a former minor league baseball player mm -hmm. drafted by the Houston Astros. Mm -hmm. My favorite team, your favorite team. It's still my favorite team. <laughs> That's good. Well, yep. Russell, thanks for being here. Thanks for letting me come and share just uh, what God's done in my life. I've loved following just what God's doing through you and the story. It's, it's an honor to be here. Thank you, man. Mm -hmm. Really means a lot. Mm -hmm. So cool. So you grew up in Houston. Is that right? I did. So uh, born and raised. Uh, my dad has been one of the executive pastors at second Baptist for probably about 30 years. Dr. Young came in 1978. And other than the OGs that came with him, yeah. um, I think my dad stepped on staff in like 1982 or 83. So I uh, went to Second Baptist School there and, uh, you know, always had a love for sports at a young age right. and played, played just about everything, football, basketball, and baseball. But baseball was always really my first love. And so, really? yeah, it just, I, my, my mom says that when I was probably three years old, she just was flipping a little soft ball in our living room and I just couldn't get enough of swinging the bat all day, every day. And so that was really all I ever dreamed of being was a, was a big league ball player. And so from a young age, I just kind of fell in love with it. Wow. Yeah. So uh, for people that may not be familiar, let's mm -hmm. say they're not local mm -hmm. uh, to Houston, uh, describe the second Baptist world uh, as best you can growing up. So think of six flags. <laughs> And think of church, <laughs> all meeting, aka Six Flags Over Jesus, is what some uh, people affectionately call it. No, I'm joking, but it it's huge. It's, it's huge. Um, you know, and I, I, uh, I, I, it was all I knew growing up. In my parents taught me what it meant to know the Lord, love the Lord, and then serve the Lord. My dad's lane of ministry is a little bit different from, uh, you know, a preaching pastor. Mm. He's more of kind of the behind the scenes. And so I remember at a young age, just kind of getting to be exposed to just what it takes to make the church run and yeah. do, doing the hard behind the scenes stuff. Sure. And so, oh. um, but, but really had the privilege of seeing second, although I didn't know it at the time because I was so young, it was really in the height of the explosive growth of the church. Oh yeah. It's like, um, I think it's still like the second or third biggest church in the country. It is. Yeah. It's, it's really for sure. Baptist churches, it's, it's up there and. I want to say it's in the top 10 uh, of okay. just largest churches in the country. So it's got a big school attached to it. Big school. And that's, and that's where I went all right. growing up. And so I was definitely immersed in the bubble is another way of describing it. Why do they call it a bubble? What are you, what are you bubbled in from? You're in, a, in some ways you're bubbled in from some of the things that the world uh, throws your way. And uh, you know, that was a, a big part of my story that I know will tackle here in a minute, but, uh, it, it was all I knew. I mean, it was kind of the world I lived in and, uh, had, had friends that I've had friendships that I've known for my entire life. Like my three best friends, we've been friends since we were in pre-K. So really, even still, though it's a huge place, it's a huge place that the church is a lot bigger than the school. And so some of my closest friends were friends that went to church there, but also went to the school and we just became friends in like first grade and have continued to stay close and still yeah. talk all the time. So I went to worship um, one time, I think. I've been to Second Baptist, and it was a great experience. Mm -hmm. It was a little overwhelming mm -hmm. because just the footprint of it mm -hmm. is enormous. Mm -hmm. But everybody there is like a small church person, mm -hmm. like the staff that welcomes you, mm -hmm. the children's ministry lady is mm -hmm. like, you're the most important person in yep. her world. Yep. Yep. <laughs> like she went out, I will never forget it. She went out of her way to like walk us around the campus That's and awesome. on a busy day mm -hmm. for her, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and then afterward, it was like, yeah, it was thousands of people there, but it seemed like everybody knew somebody. Right. So it was like groups forming and 
Right. You know, the criticism of churches like that is always that they're cliquish or whatever. Right. But what I see is community. Yeah. And they, they, they do a good job of trying to keep it, like, make it feel small. They're one of those churches that still have the, the Sunday school model. And yeah. so it, it, it definitely is big in the worship service. But for those that really want to get involved, you can really know. You can't know everybody. Yeah. But you can be known by somebody. Okay. And so that's kind of what they've tried to do over the years. So there's a, I mean, on top of that, in that bubble. You lived in the the bubble inside a bubble, right. being a preacher's kid. That's right. Um, was that a typical preacher's kid experience where, like, you're lifted up on a pedestal and you're not supposed to, like, get in trouble like other kids do? Did you feel that pressure? Definitely, especially because my dad's role uh, at the church has kind of also been the disciplinarian, if you really? will. Yeah, like, my dad's the guy that, like, don't get in trouble or Mr. Dixon's going to find out. Ooh. And so that was, that was something that I always— uh, just kind of had that looming over the life in the fishbowl. I know you're a PK as well. And so, you know, it's, we, we definitely have that, uh, that l- kind of looking over our shoulder, feeling like our dads are watching and they're going to find out that we're in trouble even before we knew. We're That's in trouble, right. right. You made a lot of deals. <laughs> That's right. With people that caught you doing stuff. That's right. If you don't tell dad, I'll yeah, give you right. some bubble gum or whatever. <laughs> right. It's like, you gotta, you gotta That's negotiate. Right. Totally. Yeah. I mean, and it, it can breed kind of resentment. Over the years, I guess. Definitely. Um, That's why preachers' kids Mm -hmm. are notorious. That's right. And it's, you know, I don't know that I really realized, and the environment I grew up in was great, but I don't know that I realized how much of a bubble it was until I went to college. And that's that's really when, I guess, in some ways, the veil was lifted from my eyes. And, you know, I think there's, it's such a hard tension because now that I've got kids and they're they're still really young, we're thinking about how we want to raise them. And we want them to to know Jesus and to be in an environment that fosters that. But at the same time, we don't want them to not be exposed right. to the things of the world where they go and run crazy the second that they're first time they're exposed That's right. to it. That's the trick. That's mm-hmm. the line we try to walk. Right? Mm-hmm. So uh, just a little bit about your dad, then. Mm-hmm. Uh, disciplinarian at a huge Texas Southern Baptist mm-hmm. church. Mm-hmm. Uh, what kind of dad was he when you were growing up? You know, he always, I think both of my parents did a really phenomenal job of trying to point us to Jesus, but also knowing that we were in a Christian school five days a week. And then one of the things that they said was a part of life in their home was they said, going to church is not optional, but anything outside of that. So youth group, you know, all the extra stuff, I say extra, I mean, just things that are not necessarily like the once a week worship, right, right. they didn't force that on us. And so- which I was grateful for that because, you know, we're in Bible class five days a week and then, you know, any, and then church on Sundays. And so they really walked a line well of encouraging us to, to love Jesus and follow Jesus. And really one of the biggest things I learned from my dad is how to live out your faith mm. because he's never been one. I mean, I remember my dad preaching a couple times over the years, but he was never one that was doing a whole lot of the preaching, but he was always doing the one he was always the one doing the serving and he was the one and has been the one that when the bottom of people's life has fallen out over the years, he's been the first person that they've called. And so, right? so I think I've learned a lot from that on that side, the shepherd side of ministry. Yeah. I learned a lot watching him do that. So, yeah. Is he, um, would you call him a, an intimidating or imposing person? He, just because of his size, you know, he's one of those that is, I mean, six, four, about two forty always carries a gun. And so, I mean, just those things alone. <laughs> that'll do it. That'll do it. And so he's definitely, he's, he's definitely a teddy bear at heart, especially now that he's a granddad because oh, yeah. those grandkids will just have him wrapped around <laughs> their little finger. And, but, uh, he, he definitely is an intimidating presence, but obviously has a, a very pastoral heart. But yeah. you know, those that don't know that and just kind of see him on a day to day, um, over the years, his lane of ministry, apparently when he was about my age, he was a lot more really outgoing, big personality. Huh. And over the years, you know, he's kind of, he still can turn that on when he needs to, but he's kind of more of the type where if he's given the option, he'll take the behind the scenes approach. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So did their strategy, uh, their parental strategy work on you when you were young? Like, did you stay out of trouble? For the most part. I mean, I don't know if that's because I'm a, a first child rule follower mm-hmm. in some ways. And I think as I look back, I mean, I, I say I gave my life to Jesus when I was eight years old and I believe I knew intellectually what salvation meant. And yeah. I believe that there was a level of heart transformation there. Although 
um, when you're eight, it's not like you're, you know, living way off in the world. But yeah. I think I knew the gospel and really strived to live it out through high school. Um, and so I think that they really did a good job of setting that example of, of what it meant to really know and love Jesus through how, how you live. Sure. So, but I think the big part of my story is that tension of the line of being in a good environment to foster Christian growth, but also being exposed to some things that, you know, I wasn't exposed to until I went to college. The bubble. The bubble. Yeah. So how do you, how do you walk that tension? So. Yeah. And how young were you when you realized, or your parents might've realized that you're just really gifted with uh, sports, with baseball? I was probably, I don't know. I was probably nine or 10 years old when I realized that I think that, and, and I also was not the kid when I was younger that was just naturally more athletic than everybody. The unique thing about baseball, baseball and golf are probably two sports where you certainly have to have a natural propensity for it, but you also, because they're both swinging sports, if you work at your swing or work at your craft enough, you really can kind of put yourself ahead of somebody, even if you're not the most naturally athletic. So I certainly wasn't like the slow kid, yeah. but I wasn't the kid in my class when we lined up for a race in PE that just smoked everybody. I was right. probably middle of the pack, but I just loved the game. I really worked at it. And so because of that, I was able to put myself in a, a, a class ahead of a lot of the same guys that I was playing around. Yeah. So. Pretty early on, you um, you realized you had something there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And through high school, you were looking to go to college and play ball. Is mm -hmm. that, were you on that fast track? Yeah. And I, I, uh, I was fortunate that I had several guys that were a couple grades ahead of me because when I was growing up, the, there was a point where I almost went to public school because there was kind of this whole, can you really get noticed by colleges if you're at this small little Baptist private school? Right. But I had a few guys that were ahead of me that really kind of paved the way for what it could look like to be a, a great ball player and get recruited by schools. And so, that helped me have the confidence to stay there at second. But I mean, I started on varsity as a freshman. That's part of why I stayed at second because had I gone to a big public school, I probably could have started by the time I was a sophomore, but just from sheer volume of people that, as a freshman, I was, and I also was like 5'8", 120 pounds soaking wet as a freshman. Right, so yeah. it wasn't very, wasn't very big physically, but I had the skill sets that were needed to be able to step in and start on yeah. varsity as a freshman. And then really my sophomore year is when I, took a big jump physically, took a big jump developmentally. And sure. that's where I kind of started to emerge as, okay, I'm not just a, you know, a, a good player, but also a, someone who could be a division one type player. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, I was a late bloomer. Mm -hmm. And so I was below average, uh, you know, height, weight until like my senior year, pretty much <laughs> junior mm -hmm. year is when I really grew. But yeah, mm -hmm. it's uh, you never really know who you're going to be as right. an athlete until you hit that growth spurt. Totally, you get know? through the awkward gangly deer stage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but man, it's hard to make it in baseball mm -hmm. because you've got to play every day and um, your family's probably taking you to some trip, mm -hmm. um, some travel team totally. obligation every week, right? Totally. And that was the life from 10 years till really through high school, every summer was tournaments throughout the summer and we're driving all over the country. And my parents were laughing, sharing stories about, because my sisters played basketball and so they were doing some tournament stuff as well. So there were stretches where mom was taking sister to a basketball tournament in Florida and then they were riding with a family back to Louisiana and, and then jumped out of the car and jumped in our car to go to a, a baseball tournament of mine. And yeah. so- that's, wow. I have three younger sisters. And so that's just kind of the life we lived yeah. for years. And looking back, I'm amazed that my parents made it all work and juggled it all. And then also still tried to make church and doing life, you know, outside of sports a priority as well. Sure. It's a huge sacrifice. Totally. For these families. Totally. I mean, you see it like even now, mm -hmm. if you've got friends that are baseball parents, mm -hmm. they just disappear for months yep. on end. Mm -hmm. And they're always like, yeah, we're in, you know, Colleen, Texas today. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, dude, you're in your 40s and totally. you're hanging out in Colleen, Texas. Totally. You make a good living. What are you doing? Totally. Being a dad. Yeah. You know? And they're playing games at all hours of the night, you know, especially yeah. if it's raining. They're, you know, I remember playing, starting a game at like 1230 a.m. <laughs> on a Saturday night. That's I'm like, crazy. what are we doing? You know? So as you got better at baseball mm -hmm. and you started to really carve out a sort of an identity with baseball. Mm -hmm. How did that affect your character or your, um, I guess, what, how good a time you were having at school? Like, did it, 
change you at all? Yeah, looking, I don't think I realized it in the moment. You know, my parents always told me, you know, baseball is what you do. It's not who you are. They always told me the right things and taught me the right things. But inevitably, when you have a passion for something yeah. and then mixed in with a talent for something, the natural temptation is to find yourself having your identity gravitate towards that. Sure. And so no matter how much I was taught by people around me, Jesus is first and, you know, this is not who you are, I naturally started to find my self-worth from that. And so with that, you know, baseball is a very fun game, but it also can be a very humbling game. Yeah. When you're one of the best hitters in the game and you only succeed three out of 10 times, yeah. you know, it's, it can bring you to your knees pretty quickly. And so I definitely rode the emotional roller coaster, if you will, sure. of, of good game, bad game. And so, but it was very easy to find my self-worth gravitating towards how I was doing with baseball. Yeah. I don't know if it's true or not, but baseball guys always seem to have a reputation among other people as being more arrogant. Mm -hmm. you, Definitely. I, I don't mean it I, it's true. as a no, judgment. No, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I was a guy that wanted to be a baseball guy, you're, so I could be speaking from there, some there's personal an, pain. There's an air about them. I mean, it's just... And, and, and they always back, get the prettiest girls. <laughs> did that work out for you? It did. I, I married... Uh, way over my ski tips. Congratulations. Thank you. It's, it's <laughs> one, one pastor friend told me, he said, most guys fall uphill that, that I fell up Mount Everest. Though, <laughs> I love it. I hope she's listening. <laughs> yes, yes, she definitely will. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you're uh, advancing through high school. At what point do the colleges start calling? I, I started getting letters, you know, and things have changed so much over the years, the last 10 years. And now I think they can act with cell phones and stuff like that. They can actually start contacting contacting you as early as, I think some players even get offered scholarships as early as like freshmen in high school. Yeah. And so now- It's least, crazy to think about a totally, freshman getting a text from- Totally. A coach, hey, we want to offer you a scholarship. <laughs> it's like you're 14 years old, you know, or crazy. 15 maybe. But back when I was in high school, they could not offer you until July 1st of, your, of going into- your senior year of oh, high school. All right. They could talk to you. Yeah. So I starting about sophomore year, I started getting contacts. They can send you letters. Hey, we've heard great things about you. We'd love for you to come to our camp or we'd love we're gonna come see you this summer. But then really your junior year is when that starts to really pick up. Okay. And so that you your your junior spring season is a really big one for baseball. And then for me, that junior summer playing on the right select team and then getting noticed, that was a big deal. But by the time I was a a junior going into my senior year, I had already pretty much identified that I was going to get offers from a lot of different schools. And then, yeah. and then by that point, I was pretty far down the road with Auburn. Yeah, uh, I knew I wanted to play in the SEC. I wanted to go to a bigger school that was not a small little private school. And then the head coach that recruited me was a really strong Christian. And that was something that was important, at least to play for someone who was known for being a man of character, man of integrity. Sure. And so all of those things just kind of seemed to line out and it pretty quickly, even though I was hearing from a lot of schools, Auburn just kind of jumped to the top so at, at an early stage. Scholarship? Scholarship, yeah. So in baseball is interesting because of Title IX, which I'm very much a fan of for, for women to have. Disclaimer. Yeah, disclaimer. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we have women deacons at our church and I'm very pro uh, women in ministry and women serving. But there are also some times where because of Title IX, there are certain guys' sports that receive kind of the short end of the stick for that. And so between football, basketball, and baseball, baseball brings in the least amount of revenue. Yeah. And so but baseball teams at the D1 level, I believe this is still the case, have 11.7 scholarships to suit out 25 guys. Right. And so almost nobody gets a full ride. Yeah. I mean, I know somebody's that there are some friends that were on a huge scholarship and it was like 95%. So, really? so just even getting offered something is definitely, yeah. definitely great. And so, yeah, they, they were actually at my house on July 1st and offered me the scholarship. And it was something we had prayed about as a family. Like there was kind of a number we felt like that, you know, we could make work. Right. And then that was the exact number they offered. And so it was, right? it was a really cool memory. And then what's funny is, so I, I committed right there on the spot. And then not five minutes after that coach left the house, Al the Alabama coach calls me, which- Of you, course. Yeah, that's the way it works. Yeah. They're arch rival. <laughs> and I tell him, I literally just committed to Auburn. He thought I was kidding. He wouldn't, I mean, he was like, yeah, right. Funny joke. Ha, ha. And I was like, no, I'm serious. I just committed to Auburn. He actually just left. And he was like, wow. That's oh, man. <laughs> so, and then I, I, by that point, I mean, I really wasn't 
in the offering game very long because I was so far down the road. But, yeah. You know, there was, I mean, Rice had, had, had recruited me and Emmon recruited me, um, several other schools that had I stayed in the, um, the open market a little while longer, I yeah. think I probably would have ended up having offers from them, but I just wanted to go ahead and get it Bird done. Bird in the hand, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Get it done. So, and Auburn's a great school. Mm -hmm. Um, Party school. It is. Kind of. It is. Were you uh, were you mostly like a good kid coming out of high school, like in I terms was. of party life? I was. And I, again, I don't know if that was because of, looking back, I don't know if it was because, only because I love Jesus or if it was because I was terrified of getting in trouble. <laughs> I think it was probably more the latter. Yeah. Um, yeah, probably. You so, know what they say totally. about, uh, second ba about uh, Southern Baptists. What's that? Is uh, the only way to keep them from uh, drinking your beer. Yeah, is bring two of them with invite you. Invite another one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so they don't tell that's on each true. other. That's it. You just bring one with you, all your beer will be gone. Yeah, man. Yep. I found that to be true. It, it, I've known a lot I of have, Southern Baptists. I have too, and I, I was one of those for a season. So. <laughs> At least y'all have some shame. I come from totally. the Methodist church where it's all just party, party, party. Party, party. party. Yep. Totally. <laughs> yeah, totally. You're proud of it. Totally. So you go to college, right. and what changed for you there? So my freshman year really tried to stay strong with my faith, but I immediately was thrown in that baseball world, which is a party, party, party world, uh -huh. and immediately started to feel the peer pressure of, you know, by that by that point, I didn't drink until I was almost a sophomore in college, and it was a balance of faith, but also, you know, some level of fear as well, and just slowly that being only surrounded by people that were not really pursuing their faith at all, right. that starts to wear on you. You know, my yeah. dad used to say, hey, you know, just you have to be cognizant, not saying you can't hang around with those guys at all, but if you're not going and building some relationships outside of the baseball circle, if you're not getting involved in a local church or a local ministry, yeah. you're eventually going to find yourself being pulled down. And that came to fruition in my life. And really it was probably towards the end of my freshman year, going into my sophomore year where I kind of went out and, I mean, frankly, got drunk for the first time in my life. And really? I was like, this is, what have I been missing? <laughs> you know, it's because it's, I mean, sin is fun at first. You That's know, right, always. You know, and then, but then you get to the other side of it and realize how empty and how vain it is. And so that set me into a full on, not an alcoholic type tailspin, but I was definitely became a party animal. And just like after games and right. Just, you know, and, whenever going out to the bar and, you know, it was, it, it was a little less during the season, mostly because I was so concerned about performance, but in some ways that didn't slow, slow down a whole lot either. I mean, we would go out on Tuesday nights after games and, you know, it was just kind of a, a wild and crazy scene. And so over a period of time, I, got to the point where I, if you looked at my life, there was nothing about my life that matched up with the Christian faith. If, really? If, if someone knew that I was a Christian, they would probably say you're a total hypocrite. Huh. And so- Were you I, still praying and stuff? I was praying and I would, I would kind of pop into church from time to time yeah. and I would go to baseball chapel, but in some ways- um, it was kind of more of in a, in a what I would call, a, a, I heard Lance Berkman use this term, a rabbit's foot Jesus theology, where mm. if I go to church, if I go to chapel, then God will help me get three hits. You know, <laughs> it was, and, and I would never openly admit that, but deep down, that's absolutely how Rabbits, I felt. So you just yes. rubbed like, yep. a, almost yep. like yep. a genie lamp. Totally. Yeah. God, if I go to baseball chapel, then please let me get three hits today. Yeah. You know, so it was um, very much of a, just a, there was, there was cracks in my faith, you know, without even realizing it, there was just not a, a, a proper sense of who God is and, mm. and what his plans were for me. And so- You were in college too. Right. It's like, we can all look back on our college days and kind of be judgmental from totally. our perspective. But, totally. You know, it's part of, part of what college seems to be there for is like to go through some of this mm -hmm. stuff and find your limits, I guess. That's right. But some people uh, aren't ready. That's right. For that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How'd you do in baseball? seems like you were kind of a stud. I did well. Uh, I, I was really uh, stood out well as offensively as a hitter. So the, the speed of the game, when you move from high school to college, it, it picks up quickly. So I was an infielder in high school. And then when I, by the time I got to college, I was not ready defensively. But uh -huh. 
But my fall of my freshman year, I mean, I swung the lights out of the bat. And so uh, it became apparent very quickly that I was going to be good enough offensively to start as a freshman, which at an SEC school. And I think we were top 25 going really? into the year. And so that was, I mean, I was hitting fifth in the lineup, which is, you know, kind of right in the, the meat of the order as a freshman. Yeah. And so I DH and played left as a freshman and uh, did well, hit right around just under 300. Um, what year was this? This was two, th my freshman spring season was 2005. So, okay. and the SEC was loaded that year with top prospects. Right, I mean, right. there was probably two or three, four first round picks out of the SEC. And, and we were really good as a team my freshman year. We stayed in the top 25 most of the year. We lost in the regional to Florida State. They went on to lose to Florida who lost to Texas in the national championship game. Hmm. So wow. we felt like we, we actually lost our Friday night starter as a freshman. And uh, he had to have Tommy John, which is kind yeah. of a common pitcher surgery. And we felt like had we had him, we could have really made a deep run in the postseason. But you're still thinking about it. Yeah, totally. I'm tell. not bitter about it at all. <laughs> Years later. I know, yeah. man. I know. I didn't mm -hmm. even make it to the level you did. And I still think about, you know, my little league game. <laughs> It eats you up for sure. I don't sure. think I was ever as good as you. I used, to, <laughs> I used to pray in the batter's box, but not to get hits. I mm -hmm. used to pray not to get, get hit. hit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just, just don't let it hit yep, me. <laughs> totally. I get that. I get that. You know, yep. God makes us all differently. He and does. Unique. He does. He gives us different gifts. <laughs> he made me to be a preacher from the start. <laughs> um, awesome. So you went to, you're a freshman in 2005. So you're um, a millennial, right? A geriatric millennial. That's they right. Say. That's right. Um, and okay. Who are your favorite players growing up? Just out of curiosity. Chipper Jones was always my favorite player. Yeah. He was, uh, I, you know, so part of it was cause I played third base mostly in high school, ended up moving to the middle infield and I switch hit through my junior year of high school, got to the point where I felt so uncomfortable right-handed cause you hardly ever see left-handed pitchers cause you bat yeah, lefting and sure. righties. Yeah. And I just felt like I have a better chance to just try to hit left on left than I do right-handed. Right. So that was part of why I love Chipper was just because he was a switch inning third baseman. and Sweet swing. Sweet swing. Always, always, I wore number 10 because of that. So that was That's always cool. my number. So. Were you too young to watch Cam and Eddie at all? I watched him. I, I remember going to the Dome to watch him yeah. in some games. And he was, he was a little bit past his prime before I started coming in. And he just was a different kind of player. I think I always liked... Uh, just I always liked Chipper Swing. I did like Cam and Eddie. Cam and Eddie was just gritty and raw. Gritty and raw, which looking back now, I'm like, I should have emulated Cam and Eddie more than I did Chipper just because he was just a gamer. Well, and maybe on the field. Yeah, not off the field. Maybe not off yeah, the field. Yeah, true. Mm -hmm. So anybody mm -hmm. who's listening, uh, Ken Cam and Eddie was like a phenom, mm -hmm. Astros um, third baseman. Mm -hmm. Awesome defensively, mm -hmm. switch hitting, mm -hmm. power hitting. Totally. And, um, Just, and he was a brick house. He was brick house. That's mm -hmm. right. Ended up with the Padres, I think. And he did. he's no longer with us. He mm -hmm. had some, uh, off the field drug issues mm -hmm. that he was never able to get a, a handle right. on. Mm -hmm. Sad story. Yeah. Super sad. But man, I remember watching him growing up and as yep. you were talking about, um, playing third base mm -hmm. and he's a beast and a switch hitter. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of came to mind. Mm -hmm. So a uh, great freshman year, even better sophomore year. From yeah. What I could tell. Yeah. Had, I, look, had, I looked at your stats. Yeah. <laughs> it's that, that's probably about the time where my stats started to slowly trickle down. I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I'll say it. <laughs> There's a reason why I'm not playing anymore. <laughs> Yeah, a great, but you were, I mean, uh, 300 plus batting yeah. average. And, and I think I finished either second in the league in doubles. And it's funny, the way that Auburn's field is set up, it's a lot like Fenway Park, where they have a big green monster in left field. Okay. The difference is in Fenway, their, their wall goes straight across, whereas Auburn kind of jets out to this like, like 400 foot Canyon in left center. Okay. And so looking back, I'm like, not that again, not that I'm bitter, but I like half of my doubles will like, like hit off the wall or like short hop the wall where if most of the other sec parks that have been homers. Right. So man, I what could have been, I know I could have signed with Bama. I know <laughs> <laughs> I could have hit, you know, three fifteen with, you know, 10, 15 homers as right. opposed to 20 doubles or whatever yeah. it was. So you ever but, seen Napoleon dynamite? You're like uncle Rico yes, right now. Absolutely. <laughs> what could have been, yes, what could have been, <laughs> you want to see my video? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. I love it. Don't make me do my Kip impression. <laughs> I might. I've just been chatting online with babes all day. <laughs> Besides, you know, I'm trying to become a cage fighter. Come on. <laughs> You're a man of many talents. Holy moly. 
<laughs> that's good. I could do that all day that with movie. you. Yeah, that's not why we're here. No, it's right. <laughs> Serious talk. <laughs> so I noticed you only played two years with Auburn. What happened? Right. So junior year uh, was going into the year. It was our last inter squad before the season started, and uh, we had a, a left handed pitcher that kind of threw out for it, his delivery was kind of behind you. Long story short, he threw a ball up and in. I tried to back out of the way, pull my hands right into it, and it breaks my thumb. Ooh. And so I ended up sitting out, and it was funny. Our, um, I went, I mean, I knew it hurt really bad, but at first, like our train, it didn't look broken. It wasn't displaced. It wasn't in the joint line. And so our trainer looked at it and he was like, you're fine, get back out there. And I'm like, dude, this hurts really bad. <laughs> like, and so finally I went to go get an x-ray on my own. And sure enough, it's split like 90% across the bone. And so I knew I was going to sit out until I was healthy. And so me and my college coach talked and we realized, hey, it's probably better for me to just redshirt this year because mm. probably six, seven, eight, nine weeks had gone by. And they Auburn actually that year jumped off to a really great start before conference play. They were like 18 and three up to number three in the country. Yeah. So they, in his mind, he's thinking, I think we're good. Let's save Russell for next year. Sure. Well, then they hit conference play and have the biggest crater in the history oh, of craters. No. And so, but it actually was a good opportunity for me to step back and really evaluate the program just as far as, you know, our coaches leadership and um, just all the different things that were going on. And yeah. um, I love my college teammates, but there was just a lot of, it seemed like there was a lot more focus on off the field shenanigans than there was on the field. Was this success. the same coach that had recruited you? So it was a different guy. So the guy that recruited me got fired my senior year of high school. No. Almost didn't go to Auburn. They give you the ability to back out. But as a freshman, I went to orientation. I met some friends and I was like, you know, I picked this school for more than baseball. Let me give it a shot. Yeah. And then, so I had done well in baseball. And so I thought, well, eventually me and my coach will start to get along, but we just, it just kind of kept getting worse and worse. And so, really? and then really once I was hurt and could step back and really kind of not be in the thick of it, in the fray, I just realized, man, this is, I don't know that this is the Auburn that I really committed to. I mean, it was to the point where when I would come home to Houston and talk to other friends that were professional baseball scouts, they would say like, hey, how's that three ring, three ring circus of a program you're at? And it's like, okay, this Yikes. is not just me. And you were like a step kid in it because right. you weren't his guy. Right. And, that, and I think that was part of, uh, and looking back, there were certainly things that he was hard on me about that he needed to be hard on me about. I mean, I was kind of a pretty boy. And, yeah. you know, I, I learned when I got to pro ball what it really meant to be like a, a grinder and just, mm. I mean, play hard all the time. And it's not like I was intentionally not playing hard, but I think I cared more about how my swing looked than I did just getting out there and getting after it. And yeah. so in hindsight, again, hindsight's twenty twenty, And so I sit out my junior year and um, I, I think, okay, I, if I only have two years of baseball left, do I really want them to be spent here? And ask myself the hard question, like, okay, I don't think that's really where I want them to be spent. And so I called, as soon as I finished the semester of school, went home to Houston, they were still playing. By that point, their season was going to be done. They weren't going to go to the postseason. And so I called my coach and said, hey, I just feel like I, if I only have two years of baseball left, I want to play somewhere else. So can I get my release? And he's like, sure. And so by that point, I was still friends with Rainer Noble, who was the longtime head coach at University of Houston. Of course, yeah. And so we had started talking and they were going to offer me a scholarship. And instead of going ahead and signing something with them, I said, hey, I've talked to a few professional teams that have asked me to come to their pre-draft workouts. I thought I was going to be a guy, this was back when the baseball draft was probably 50 rounds. Yeah. And so I thought I was going to go in the 48th round <laughs> as maybe like just a flyer. And a lot of times that's what teams will do. They'll take you really late as it's a safe pick because if they don't sign you, they're not going to get their hand slapped. Right, right. But if they really want to sign you, they'll offer you a higher signing bonus, you know, than your slot. Sure. And so I thought I was going to go really late as just a, hey, we're going to take a chance on you. Right. And so I said, let me get through these couple pre-draft workouts. And then if they don't take me high enough, then let's let's get this thing done. Well, I go, I was invited to the, the two pre-draft workouts I were invited to was the Pirates and then the Astros. Mm. And the Astros was at Minute Maid. And I just had the workout of my life. I mean, really ran a 6-4 in the 60, which is probably about a 4-4-40. That's and, crazy. And then... They, they clock your arm from the outfield and I threw like 92 from the outfield and then they give you like 20 swings and I hit like probably eight balls out and like three of them were in the upper deck and they were Come like, on. 
uh, okay, we'll take you. So <laughs> the, the draft started going by. Uh, this was when they did the first five rounds. They may still do it this way on the first day. And I thought I was going to go in the fifth round. Didn't go in the fifth round. Then the the next day, the first round is the sixth round. Thought I was going to go in the sixth round. I remember I had actually gone up to Eau Claire, Wisconsin to start playing summer ball because I had missed a whole season and I knew I needed to get sure. some at-bats. Yeah. And so my dad had gone up there with me and we're sitting in the hotel. You know, my agent's like, hey, I think they're taking the sixth. They don't take me. And I literally almost walked out of the room oh, to man. go get breakfast because I was like, this is not going to happen. And he said, just hang tight. I think that this might happen. And then sure enough, in the seventh round, you know, I get a call about two minutes. We're watching it on the draft tracker and I get a call and they said, hey, we're, we want to take you with our seventh round pick. And, uh, and then I see it pop up and it was just kind of a surreal moment. The moment you've always dreamed of yeah, as a of baseball course. player. I so. mean, at that point, so seventh round, is there a, a round number where you're thinking if I'm 15th round, I'm going back to college? Yeah, it really, a lot of it depends on the the signing bonus that they offer yeah. you because you want it to be worth your while. So most major league teams back then and still today, as a as a separate part of your signing bonus, they will agree to pay for the rest of your college. Oh. So, which is, is great as a baseball player because, again, remember Title IX, I was on what was considered like a big scholarship at Auburn and I was on like 60, 65%. Yeah. So now that's a full ride on the major league team the rest of your way. How does that work though? Once you're playing, you can go to college at the same time? You just take classes in the fall gotcha. and the off season. Gotcha. And, and a lot of guys wait till they're done. You have like a two year clock once you've officially retired to start. Otherwise the money goes away. Mm. But it's great for a major league team because it's unfortunately a lot of guys never take advantage of it. They just either, really? they don't go back or whatever. And so it's not always guaranteed money on their part. And then in addition to that, they'll give you kind of a cash signing bonus. And so, for as we talked as a family, we felt like in order for it to be worth me leaving two years of college on the table, we felt like I needed to sign. It didn't matter where I went. I could have gone in the 49th round, but whatever team drafted me, I needed to go to get a fifth round signing bonus or higher to make it worth my while. And then the Astros took me in the seventh. And then this was back when they there was a rule that every pick after the fifth round cannot sign for a dime more than the last pick in the fifth round without going through the commissioner's office for approval. Whoa. And I was a good player, but I was not the kind of person that they're going to go burn one of their <laughs> approvals on. Yeah. You know? And so I ended up signing for exactly what that last pick in the fifth round got. Okay. And, and that was what they offered. And just, we said, okay, let's, let's, um, let's take it in and, go off to the races. And yeah. so I sign, I get to go to Minute Maid and they give you a jersey, which because they took me in the seventh round, they gave me a jersey with number seven on it, which this That's was- Biggio's Exactly. <laughs> and, I, and I have pictures of me and Biggio when I'm what? like- eight years old. He's still playing at the time. What? I'm literally like Wayne's world. I'm like, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. <laughs> wow. you know, I literally went up to him and showed him the picture. He's like, wow, you're making me feel old. And uh, I was like, I just want you to know that they gave me this and I don't feel right wearing this, but I'm yeah. just going to wear it for today. And yeah, well, once again, for any listeners that aren't geeking out right mm -hmm. now with me, yeah. <laughs> uh, Craig Biggio, uh, all time Houston Astro Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. um, he played some second base he like did. you and uh, catcher and center field mm -hmm. as well. Um, but just a stud and I was in the him. twilight of his career. Yep. He was in the twilight. Point. I think he was maybe had a year or two left at that point. Was this 09 or? It was, I was in the 2007 draft. Okay. And I think he retired in 09 or. Got it. Somewhere around there. It's right after they went to the series. It was. And yeah. got swept. That's right. By the Sox. That's right. So. Dark days. It was dark days of the Astros. <laughs> I, and I tell people it's because of their poor draft choices. Yeah. <laughs> Right. That and maybe the curse of Enron. That's yeah, true. That that definitely had an impact <laughs> for sure. So what'd you do with the money? What's the first thing you bought? You know, honestly, this is going to sound boring, but I, well, I put most of it away. I that needed, does sound I, boring. Yeah, I know. I, I, I needed a new <laughs> truck, move. but we we used the trade-in of, of my old truck. And then plus they originally charged me a New York state income tax because my first Oof. assignment was New York, but it was one of those like, I was getting it back. So I didn't have to pay a whole lot of money out of pocket. So it was, but I got a new truck because I, I needed one bad. Yeah. And so, but then that's really, honestly, I've tried to to tuck most of it away. I, I used to 
jokingly call it the future Mrs. Dixon fund. There I you go. That she was always going to spend it. <laughs> Let's talk <laughs> about her point. for a sec. Did yeah. She, was she in the picture at that Not point? Not at that point. We didn't meet till much later. I was already done playing. Um, so you stayed single? I dated around a little bit, um, but nothing nothing really to write home about. I, I say that. there was When I was 23, I was in a pretty serious relationship that actually was basically to the point of engagement and uh, ended up, the, the girl broke it off and mm. right the lot. We, we weren't actually engaged, but, um, you know, and, and it obviously in that moment I was devastated, but looking back, you know, she's happily married, I'm happily married. And so yeah. it was total, total God thing in that process. Right. So. So at that point, you're thinking you're going to be a, just like a major league mm -hmm. ball player, mm -hmm. like you're set. Right. And I thought I was going to, you know, try to use that as my platform to, to be a light for Jesus. And so you'd come full circle with faith at that I point? I had, and, and I really feel like in pro ball, and again, I don't know, I wish I could tell you I was fully confident it was solely because I wanted to be fully devoted to following Jesus. But I also, there was this other element of not wanting to jeopardize my career. Mm. And so I, I, in pro ball, I really feel like I tried to walk that line of being in the world and not of it. I still would go out with the guys and I would still casually drink, but it was not to the craziness level that it was in college. Yeah. And so- um, but How long did that last? Uh, really up until my I got let go and my playing days were done. So I played- How many seasons. years? A couple seasons? Yeah, I was in the Astros organization for three years. Um, had an okay first summer. Had an Had a- a decent first half of my first full season and then just tanked in the second half. I, mean, I hit like 280 in the first half and then like 070 in the second half. Ooh, it was rough. Martin Maldonado level. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, it was rough, which when you can catch like he can, you can get away with it, <laughs> but not when you're a corner outfielder that's like supposed to hit. Supposed otherwise, to hit. You're not going to make it. So. Yeah. Is there, tell me about the pressure in that. Oh, it was, I mean, immense pressure. And a lot of it was what I put on myself. I mean, being a Houston kid, I always kind of dreamed of being the future face of the franchise and that kind of stuff. And there, there was even some conversations in the front office just because I grew up here. Yeah. Like, you know, we could see him being kind of our next, you know, golden boy kind of yeah. thing. And so I, I put a lot of pressure on myself, but, um, you know, it, it, it was almost the more pressure I put on myself, the worse I did. Mm. And so I uh, go into my second full season, went back to, and, and the Astros went through a major organizational change after I was drafted. So Tim Perpura drafted me. He was the GM that drafted okay. me. And then him and like three or four guys he worked with all got let go. And then Ed Wade came in right after that. Uh -huh. And so my first spring training, which was spring of 08, was also Ed Wade's. And I remember him saying, we want guys that we've drafted and developed to get to the big leagues. And when I first heard that, I'm like, great, I was drafted by the Astros. <laughs> you like, weren't drafted by Ed Wade. I was not drafted by <laughs> Ed Wade. It was later on that after the 08 draft happened and two or three college outfielders leapfrogged over me. Yeah. I was kind of like, hmm. This feels so, familiar. This, Yeah, this feels- Like your college. Totally. Feel. It was kind of, and, and, you know, granted, had I hit 330 with 30 home runs, it had been a moot point, but yeah. that's kind of the point of the minor leagues is you're, you need the time to develop, especially when you go in the top 10 rounds, they say that typically you're going to get a whole lot of opportunities. You almost have to prove that you can't do it uh -huh. before you can, but then you combine that with an organizational change. And I had a, a glimmer of where I rebounded. I made the all-star team in the New York Penn League and was actually roommates with J.D. Martinez, who oh, wow. plays for the Red Sox. Of and um, the ageless wonder. Yep, he can- Just Keeps going. He can flat out hit. And so, great I guy. I, I know, him. I know. <laughs> As an Astros fan. I, I do too, as an Astros <laughs> fan. But, uh, so we were, that, and then going into my last spring training, which was 2010, I knew I needed to either break camp going to Corpus Christi or I knew I was going home. And okay. Made it through till about the very end. Uh, made it through the first two big release waves. And then about two days left in camp, I get a tap on my shoulder and they say, hey, go see the Ooh. the the minor league manager and uh, or minor league coordinator. And I thought this is either really good or really bad. And I yeah. walked in and Tal Smith, if you remember Tal's Hill. I do remember that vaguely because so I, I didn't I didn't know about that until I moved here. Yeah. So he was the, the president of business operations for a long time. And the guy who was my agent is a great godly man. He was he was in that role for years and then stepped away to become a sports agent. So there was a lot of interface with him in the front office. And okay. so I walked into the minor league coordinator's office and Tal Smith, who's the president of the, the big league club, is sitting in the office. And I'm like, 
okay, this is either really good or really <laughs> bad. And then they start to say, you know, hey, we love you as a person, but yeah. you're just, obviously you're not hitting. And so, oh. yeah, it's time to let you go. And so I uh, I spent about a year at that point doing indie ball. It's similar to, um, I know the Skeeters are now, I guess they've changed their name, those Space Cowboys. Space Cowboys. And they're now the AAA affiliate of the Astros. But for years, yeah. they were an independent team where you're still getting paid to play, sure. but you're not affiliated with a major league team. And so I did that for about a year, but it seemed like every door that opened immediately shut. And okay. so I guess flash forward to May of 2011, I finally realized it's it's time to hang it up. I had signed with an uh, indie team in Roswell, New Mexico. Ooh. I mean, weird place, <laughs> really weird place. And granted, I was, the, the downward spiral, I think, was starting for me. Yeah. You know, I was starting to run back to to alcohol and, and Were all you? that. Yeah, just, you know, it wasn't quite- Coping? To, coping and it wasn't quite to the full blown alcoholic level yet but it was definitely heading in that direction and did I you get, know it i felt it I, I remember thinking and being around the wild baseball guys and like they're all passed out and i'm still boozing and i'm like this isn't normal yeah. you know like the, these are the wildest guys of the bunch and i'm you know running laps around them and like taking pride in it and and then also at the same time claiming to love jesus and uh, it's just this weird dichotomy there right and so I felt like, okay, this is enough's enough. It was basically a glorified men's league at that point. Yeah. And so I hang it up and go home. And can I ask, what, yeah. what were you making at that time? I mean, a pittance. It was basically like, you know, those leagues you're making, I mean, maybe 500 bucks a paycheck. You're probably having to live with a host family. So in the minor league level, I was making probably 1,200 bucks a month. Okay. You know, but you're again, ideally, you have a host family you live with. And then you're working odd jobs in the off season. And I lived at home to save money. So it's it's very much feast or famine. I mean, they set it up that way where you're either getting up and getting to the big leagues or you're getting out because yeah. it's, it's hard to make it financially if you're not independently wealthy. Right. So, Where's the booze coming from? You know, some of it's- some, some of a low light or something. Yeah. Some of it is, you know, off season baseball lessons. But then honestly, one, I mean, I started dipping into my bonus at that point. Okay. You know, especially once I, I hung it up and retired, I started having to pull out some. And I was working an odd job for a family friend. And I thought I wanted to end up in college coaching when I was done. And I did go to Hardin Simmons the fall of 2011, um, which was- it To was coach? A, to coach, yeah. I coached their baseball, just small Christian colleges, you know, yeah. in Abilene. And honestly, that was um, because of my own personal choices. And it ended up just throwing fuel on the fire. What do you mean? Uh, just the, the the pending addiction and alcoholism. Just I'm a single guy. I'm frustrated about my baseball career being over, and I'm in Abilene, Texas, and mm. it's not exactly a thriving metropolis with great single Christian groups. You know, it's not Roswell, right? And it's not definitely not Roswell. <laughs> definitely not Roswell. But could get worse. Yeah. So, but, but I then, and I was in this weird place of like not being one of the college players. And so I, I got to keep a little bit of a distance from those guys because I'm their coach, but also I'm not going home to a family every night. Right. And obviously because of the, it was ultimately because I was choosing to turn to an empty vessel, th why I was heading down this way. What do you mean? Just alcohol. And, and, and then I was prescribed to Adderall when I played. And so, why? uh, ADD, ADHD. And so our, our, some of our coaches, Noticed some ADD tendencies in the outfield. I would kind of space out. It wasn't so much at the plate, but I would kind of space cadet and yeah. not not be paying attention. And so they suggested that I go talk to a doctor. And I had I had never taken it growing up. My mom just kind of always stayed on me and wore me out about school stuff in a good yeah. way. Yeah. Um. So, but uh, so wait. I, I thought Adderall was considered um, a performance enhancing drug. It can be if you're not prescribed to it, but and and been approved. So, um, so Major League Baseball around that time started instituting what they call a TUE, which is a therapeutic use exemption. Okay. And so, if you go to a doctor and go through the whole process, then you have it. I, I had a TUE, and, and then because when I was in pro ball, I generally took it as prescribed. I yeah. Mean, occasionally, I would take like a little half of one more if I felt like I needed a little more. Okay. But it wasn't. What did it do for you? It just helps you focus. It gives you energy, you know. Um, it's a little bit of a bump. A little bit of a bump. And so, and again, I was not abusing it at that point. But then when I get out and I'm done playing and I realize, you know, it, what turns to like, I'm applying for college coaching jobs. 
it's 3.30 and I'm like, ah, I can have a beer. It's not a big deal. You know, it's uh-huh. five o'clock somewhere. Right. And then that turns into what I would do is I would take, I'd have to take more Adderall to come down off of the, the vicious booze cycle. And then uh, I eventually read and hear somewhere that if you pop an Adderall before you go out, then you can drink all night. And so I started doing that. I mean, had is that gl- true? Oh yeah. It's, I mean. Is it, it counteracts the it's, alcohol? Yeah. It's because it's the chemical breakdown is it's, it's an amphetamine. Yeah. So it's, it's basically like you're taking prescribed meth. And so. You, just in tiny doses, theoretically. Just, right. And so, but then. You know, what, what I'm prescribed to do is to take one twice a day and I'm taking like four first thing in the morning and then, four. yeah, I mean, it, it, pretty quickly. It didn't so take get, long. Is that because you're hungover? Yeah. A lot. And a lot of it is it eventually became to like taking an Adderall at night and then staying up all night drinking, you know? And so it's this weird state of like night becomes day, day becomes night. And I'm getting a month prescription and burning through it in a week. If that gives you. But how would you get more prescriptions? Doctor shop. So you'd go, I'd go to, this was back before they really tightened up on Uh, things. So you could, if you paid cash, you could go to another doctor and they would they would write you a prescription and you go fill it and there's Bro. yeah it was it was bad i mean i was going to a doctor in abilene you buy it off the street off somebody else that was prescribed to it and they just want to make some money and so it never trickled outside of that but i think that was the dangerous place for me because that's how i justified it yeah you know i thought i'm prescribed to this and so i was never like going and, and snorting coke or smoking weed or anything like that because those were like you get this at the pharmacy right exactly yeah, it yeah. was kind of like my white collar drug mm. um and so that that started a in the fall of 11 a six seven eight nine month downward spiral and by the time my sister megan got married in december of 2011 and even by december of 2011 my family started to realize he's a mess like really i mean it was how do you know they were realizing that? Did they talk to you? Yeah, they would later tell me. And, you know, I'm getting these subtle, like, text messages from family friends, like, hey, we need to go to lunch. And I had, I mean, I had probably three or four interventions from family friends. Some of those pre-K buddies I told you about earlier, they sat me down on, on the cafe at Jane's Grill and they were like, hey, we're worried about you. And What were they seeing that worried them? Uh, just the the crazy... I mean, how much I was drinking, how much I was outpacing them. Um, there so was they saw you drinking heavily. Heavily. And and at weird hours, like, you know, just, I mean, you know, at lunchtime going and grabbing a beer and they're like, this is not normal. And they didn't know you were having to come down from the four right, Adderall. Right. So, yeah, most people that are heavy drinkers tend to slow down. Right. But as you're drinking, you're also outpacing everyone. Right. People are like, what is happening? Right. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, you're drinking, you know. 10, 12 beers a night. And and then the scary thing is not acting drunk because of, you know, the Adderall has this weird sobering effect, but you're also feeling the buzz from both wow. the Adderall and the alcohol. And it was, uh, you know, they, they sat me down and it was- Who's they? So uh, my buddies, Alex, Jonathan, and David. Okay. And went to school with them since pre-K at Second Baptist School. And, yeah. and they all like casually drank and we would drink and have fun, but they were all like responsible and they'd have like two or three beers and be done. And then I'm sitting there ripping a 12 pack by myself and they're like, what is wrong with him? You know? Yeah. And um, so they, they, they had an intervention with me and like, Hey, they're, you know, Hey, we're worried about you. And just to give you a full picture, I mean, I was ripping beers in the car on the way to the intervention. I don't think you're supposed to do that. No, <laughs> <laughs> definitely not. But, but I couldn't admit that I had a problem. I mean, I, I basically told them, Hey, I, I appreciate y'all sharing this, but I'll let you know when I have a problem. Yeah. And they're like, this is why we're here. This is really not normal. And so. Isn't that the craziest thing though? Mm-hmm. Like looking back, knowing mm-hmm. that you actually said those things, mm-hmm. that drinking, you know, a couple of beers on the way to an intervention in your yes, car. In my car. It's not a problem. In the parking lot of a Baptist church that Oof. I grew up at. <laughs> oh, it that, just keeps coming. Yes. So mm. it, um, you know, that it took several conversations. Had another family friend that was a uh, recovered cocaine addict. And he, when he saw me, at my sister's wedding, he just knew because they say addicts, they just know. Yeah. And so he just saw, saw a look in my eye and he just said, something's not right. And so he took me to lunch a couple of weeks later and said, if you don't get help, you're going to die. And, you know, I, and I mean, he was right, but I just, I tried to, sh- I was like, he, and I said, well, what do you think I should do? So I started to kind of admit, I realized this isn't normal, yeah. but I didn't want to do whatever it took to get better. 
And then he was basically saying, you need to go to rehab. And I, that's when I started playing the whole, well, I mean, I'm a college coach and, you know, I'm doing this Bible study for, it was a very duplicitous life. Yeah. You know, I was, I was doing a Bible study for these guys and then going out and getting ripped at night. Um, and, you know, I was like, well, I'm my dad's kid. Like I can't, you know, I can't go to rehab. He'll, right. he'll never live that down. And he was trying to say, no, I've talked to him and he wants you to get better. And I just kept dodging it and dodging it. And, uh, did your dad ever talk to you directly? Yeah, they, they definitely had several points where they voiced their concern. Um, you mentioned it like your sister's wedding or something yes, earlier. Yeah. What happened there? I just, I mean, I was on, I was loaded on Adderall, probably had taken her, her wedding was at night. And I don't even remember how I, I probably had taken 10 or 12 and then had a, had a pocket flask and was just you know, burning that all night. And this was one of those because she's a Baptist preacher's daughter. There was no alcohol at the wedding. And so, but yet I'm somehow turned, you know. And and, so, in your mind, that's like a, a crime. Yeah, totally. It's like, who yeah. doesn't have alcohol at a wedding? Totally. And I'm like, <laughs> this is, and we have alcoholism in our family history. And that's yeah. part of, so three out of my four grandparents all battled it. And that was part of why my parents always encouraged us to stay away from it. But when you're a kid in their home, you think, oh, because it's Satan's juice, you know, uh-huh. and because we're Baptists and because it looks bad. But that really, in hindsight, wasn't the heart behind their message. It was like, hey, we don't want you to become what we've seen in our family. Right. And so, um, yeah, they just, they, they had tried to approach me around Christmas of that 2011. And then I go back to Abilene in January And I had kind of one of those two or three day benders in January where I ended up having this crazy vivid, like, I don't know what you want to call it, like dream hallucination that I was driving and I was under the influence and we got in a wreck and my sister died. And I like wake up screaming. I call my dad and he he knows by this point, like something is really wrong with Russell. And so at this point I go, okay, I realize something's not right. I'm fully dependent on the Adderall, but let me try to just quit drinking cold turkey because mm-hmm. I realized I can't do the Adderall and drink like this. And I was actually successful at removing the Adderall, but my whole life at this point, because- wait, wait, I, the alcohol or the Adderall? The alcohol. Okay. So I quit drinking cold turkey, yeah. but my whole life at this point was centered on changing the way that I felt because I was running to things other than the Lord to fill me up. Right. And that's what they say in AA, you know, you're, you're completely hooked on changing the way that you feel. And so instead, just to counterbalance it, I'm taking more Adderall. So I start taking even more than I already was. It's counterintuitive. Totally counterintuitive. Seems like you would need less. Yeah. And and you started taking more. Started taking more. uh, How much more? I mean, at least five or 10 more a day. I mean, to the point where flash forward to March of 2012, and this is kind of when things hit rock bottom, my coach that I was working for in Hardin Simmons sent me to Houston to do a recruiting trip. And the doctor, I I went doctor shopped and got a three month prescription. So 180, 30 milligrams. They do that? They used to, not anymore. Probably because of crazy people like me. Yeah. And so I started and it wasn't like I was, I never would say I wanted to kill myself, but I was miserable. I mean, Uh I knew I had lived in a place where there, I knew there was a better way. And I mean, I started taking five or I would take four or five at a time. And over a three or four day period, I, I think I ended up taking like 70, 75 Adderall in like three or four days. Jeez Louise. I mean, most doctors said I should have gone into cardiac arrest. I didn't sleep a wink. By this point, I'm incoherent. I, I no-showed for a couple of the games I was supposed to go to. My phone's off the grid. Parents are trying to get a hold of me because I was staying at their house, but they were on a trip to see one of my sisters. And it just, I was, I mean, the epitome of strung out. I yeah. mean- and they finally, I finally get enough phone battery to, to get my dad on the phone. And he just said, Russell, please don't go anywhere. I mean, mm-hmm. he knew I was messed up. And then he asked one of his police friends to even come by the house to do like a well check on me because it was so bad during that stretch where I was off the grid. My dad legitimately thought I had had a heart attack and died in the house. And so right? he didn't want to come back home and find me like that. My but gosh. I was by the grace of God, I was still alive. And then not long after this police officer did the well check, my parents come home. And I knew at that point, I knew in the depths of my soul that if I didn't surrender, I was going to be dead. Yeah, It was a miracle that I wasn't dead already. And so literally they came home and they could have said, do anything. And I would have done it because I was so miserable with how I felt. And 
they said, Russell, we think you need help. And I said, I completely agree. Wow. And I was willing to do whatever it took. And so that Were night, you? yeah, that night they said, we think you need to go to rehab. And we loaded up and I drove down to Bay Area Recovery Center in Dickinson and, and checked in. Really? Mm -hmm. So um, before that time, mm -hmm. when the addiction was ramping up, how long could you go without taking Adderall? I mean probably not more than a day. And if I did, I would, I would basically sleep all day. Like that you was would just sleep. I was just so exhausted from being used to having this external ramp upper, if you will. And I know that's not a word. I just made it up. No, but, it makes sense. Yeah. We talked, um, for this same episode, we talked to a doctor, mm -hmm. a researcher, Anna Lemke, mm -hmm. who wrote Dopamine Nation. And she talked about how basically we're all constantly high mm -hmm. on dopamine release at this mm -hmm. point. Um, obviously you were for obvious reasons, you know, with the actual substance you were taking, mm -hmm. but the rest of us are constantly seeking a, the next micro high or whatever, just right. even by reaching for your phone. Right. Um, we just can't be bored and right. still, mm -hmm. we can't let ourselves just be. And it's interesting because you had such a tangible substance to mm -hmm. take away, to take out of the equation you're able to see exactly in the moment what your body was missing. Right. Because your first body, your body's first response is then to just go to sleep and shut it down, mm -hmm. which is what you needed. Right. You needed to shut it down. Totally. And you needed to do that regularly, but you hadn't done that for so long mm -hmm. that you take the substance out for even a moment and your body's like, Yep. Shut down. Shut down. Shut down time. And that's literally when I checked into rehab, they said I slept for like three or four days straight. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't eaten. And I sometimes wonder if you take people's phones away for mm -hmm. a day, would they just sleep? Mm, maybe. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's scary. It's After scary. they get over the withdrawal, right? Totally. <laughs> so let's talk about that part yeah. as you, as you check in in Dickinson, mm -hmm. um, I've seen in other things that you've, uh, other stories about you that, mm -hmm. uh, that you speak well of that time, but was it, mm -hmm. it could not have been easy at the start. Oh no. I mean, it's cause. What's you know, the come down like? I mean, it was, it was crazy. And you know, you feel like you got I woke up and felt like I'd been hit by a Mack truck. I mean, just, you know, and you wake up and you're like, what in the world have I done? And, you know, I'm at the point now where my dad has to call the college coach that I'm working for and say, Russell just checked into rehab and I can't, he can't come back and finish the season. Yeah. And so, I mean, it just was, it was the, the ultimate moment of humility where you're just lower than low and, uh, you're ashamed, in a, shamed. And you're around a bunch of other people that their drug of choice was maybe a little bit different, but all in the same place. Mm. But I'm so thankful that I had been so humbled in that process. You know, there's a there's a, a line in the 12 steps. It's, I believe it's in the first step where it says, be, had become powerless over alcohol. And that part, I was never really able to admit because I'm an athlete. I'm not powerless no, over anything. Right. Yeah. But the thing that struck me there's a line that says, and our lives had become unmanageable. Yeah. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because I knew, I mean, I had a mountain of trash in the back of my truck. Like what kind of savage does that? Yeah. And just because I was such a mess, I couldn't even take the trash out of my truck. Hmm. And so I knew in the depths of my soul that even though my drug of choice was different than some of these guys that are heroin addicts or whatever, I knew I was one of them. And Well, there's nothing more dangerous when you're addicted or when you're a mess, to have someone who's a little messier to look down on. Mm -hmm. Totally. Because then you can feel like you're normal. Totally. By comparison. Totally. Well, I'm not as bad as him. Right. So. And we we take a lot of false assurance from that. Totally. And that's where, I don't know, I, I really have to believe it was the Lord just continuing to put me in a place of humility because not one point during my time in rehab there did I ever have that attitude. I, I had... Rather, I had every time I went into a, a meeting or a group meeting, it was as I would hear someone else share, I would think, man, that's me. Like mm. it's different places, different choices, different drugs, but that's me. Really? And I just knew it. I mean, it was like God was using the 12 steps in such a profound way because it took all of the, the stuff that guys like you and I grew up under uh -huh. and just made it simple. Yep. Just made it simple. Man, I've never had any like substance issues, thank mm -hmm. God, because- mm -hmm. I, I've never, I've not always had the highest character mm. in my life and mm -hmm. I've always been prone to impulsivity, mm -hmm. 
which is why I say thank God about the substance mm -hmm. stuff, because if I was wired to be susceptible in that mm -hmm. way, I would have been. Mm -hmm. But I, I did consume a lot of, you know, pornography and mm -hmm. things uh, like that early on in life. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is discovering the big book was, um, and that's the the 12 step book um, mm -hmm. for anyone who's unfamiliar, was a revelation to me. Mm -hmm. Because even though my faith was non-existent, really, mm -hmm. in terms of Christianity at that time, I mm -hmm. did find uh, core truths just on mm -hmm. those pages totally. of that inspired text. Totally. Um, that although it was written about alcoholism right. or drug addiction, uh, it was my book. Yeah. My story. Totally. Because uh, even with porn, it worked the same way. Totally. And that was, I mean, addiction has various tentacles. That was certainly something I I battled as well. And it was... The craziest thing about it is when when I surrendered and started working the steps, it was like God set me free from all of it. Yeah, I really? Mean, I mean, just, and it was, but it was not a all at once. It was as I worked the steps, as I had a a very, very honest step four of fearless and searching moral inventory where I really, at Bay Area, they tell you to write everything down. Yeah. I mean, where were you selfish? Where were you dishonest? Where were you fearful? Where were you resentful? So I just put it all out there. And then the key was, in the step five where you find a closed mouth friend, your sponsor, and you tell them everything. And they always say, even that thing that you swore you would never tell anybody, yeah. you tell them that thing. Why is that important? It's the, it's, I think it's the biblical concept of confession, you know, just of, of on it, confess your sins to one another, you yeah. know, and it's, there's just something freeing about once it's out in the open, it's, it's like the enemy can't keep it in the dark anymore. Uh -huh. you've, you've hit it and you've hit it and you've yeah. hit it. And, so for me, there just even there was something about that with me stepping into rehab, going like, okay, it's out in the open, right? And uh, Dr. Lemke, to bring her up again, talked mm -hmm. about how um, when you're taking recovery seriously, a lot of people just are terrified of telling even the smallest lie. Mm -hmm. You tell one little lie, and, and it's almost like a re huge red flag, yep. um, which is eye opening because it first of all speaks to how delicate a situation sobriety can be, right? Um, but it also speaks to, I think, how sobriety is uh, all or nothing. It is. And sobriety and transparency go hand in hand. They do. Um, and if you, it's not just about telling new lies, mm -hmm. but keeping old ones. That's right. <laughs> Secret. That's right. And I've walked a lot of friends through recovery, and I've been through it, obviously, mm -hmm. with my own addiction in the past, but mm -hmm. where you don't even remember what you forgot. Mm-hmm until later that's right and it's not that you've been hiding something but when it comes to the surface you better tell somebody totally you know what i'm saying no, totally. this is something only addicts would probably understand that's right but like um, a memory that you've kept way hidden mm -hmm. from yourself mm -hmm. will come back and and then lest it eat your lunch yep. you better tell somebody that's it and it's still to this day i try to you know do the same thing i mean you know 10 step when you're wrong you promptly admit it and i mean i'll i'll go back to our team constantly even if it's just something that the message of what I shared was not wrong, but maybe the method was a little intense because yeah. that's a lot of addicts have that intensity. Yeah, uh, I'll just say, hey, uh, I think the message that I shared was right, but I just want to apologize because how I shared it was not was not okay. And uh -huh. Will you forgive me in that? And it's just, I mean, you know this being in leadership, it's just, that's a profound place for a lot of people because there's a, unfortunately a lot of leaders that they can't do that. They don't yeah. walk in humility and they don't admit when they're wrong. That's right. So what, as you went through that time, was it three months? Three months. Yeah. Three months, a mm -hmm. long time. Mm -hmm. um, what did you learn, especially about your own um, story and baseball and all of that and how it mixed into mm -hmm. the, uh, the issue of addiction? You know, I realized just how big of a idol and a God I had made that in my life. Um, you know, just how, how much I found self-worth in that. And you know, again, was always taught the right stuff, but had never been confronted with the reality of what is that like? Like, who am I really just with me? Am, am I truly, do I truly see myself as a son of Jesus, like a son of the most high? Yeah. You know, can I rest in that? Am I a child of God first and not, well, he's Russell, the baseball player, but he also loves the Lord. Uh -huh. So, so I learned a lot about that. And then I learned a lot about humility. And I mean, more than I realized, even though, in the grand scheme, I really wasn't that good because uh, if I was, you know, there's some truth in the fact that I'd still be playing. <laughs> I mean, I I would never openly profess this, but inside I thought I was the man. I sure. Mean, I mean, thought I was God's gift to whatever. And so that was something beautiful about the program is they teach you 
to die to yourself and yeah. to pick up the trash on the ground. And like in Bay Area, they don't have housekeepers. The housekeepers are the residents. Uh, and so you're immediately signed with cleaning the toilets and doing the, the, the vacuuming and cleaning. Every morning they would have the after morning meditation. The, every resident would clean up. And so yeah. there was just this constant like being forced to be in that place of living out the truths that we see in the pages of scripture. They're just kind of slightly morphed in, in the 12 step fashion uh-huh. basically. So overall was it, I mean, clearly you're here and alive, so mm-hmm. it must've been a good experience. Yeah. But as you look back, was it, was it something positive? Oh, at that I time? mean, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, it's rehab, uh, rehab. It's, I mean, it was the hardest decision I've ever made, but it was also the clearest decision I ever made. I mean, I just, I knew that if I didn't get help that I was going to be dead. And as I look back on my time there, I know that it was a divine appointment because he, it was almost like he represented, the Lord represented himself to me in this whole new way. It's like the addicts have this term where when you work the steps, it's like you have this golf ball that is your obsession with drugs and alcohol. And when you really work the steps and not just get sober, but get free, it's almost like that you wake up one day and that golf ball is just not there. Really? It just, I can't explain it, but it's like I woke up one day and I just saw the world differently. Was that day in rehab? It was. It was really after I, after I did my fifth step where I just said, here it is. And then as I started to make amends to people, because that's where a lot of people in recovery get hung up. They either don't make all their amends. They don't make an honest list of who they need to make their amends to, Mm. or they may have somebody that's on their list. Cause it says in step eight, it says, uh, made a list of the persons we had harmed and became willing to make direct amends to them all, except when to do so would harm them or harm others. Uh. And so the, the willingness was the key part because a lot of addicts are not willing. There's some family that they messed over for years and they don't want to talk to them. And so even though logistically it may be hard to go see them, what they tell you to do is if you're worried about the relationship, just write a letter to them. And so like I wrote a letter to the college coach that I worked for. I knew it was going to be hard to pin him down in person. And I wrote him a letter saying exactly what I did wrong, owning it, apologizing for it, asking for forgiveness. And then the letter he wrote back, I have saved on my desk ever since then. I mean, mean, just goosebumps, you know, the second I read it, just total forgiveness and, total support and total freedom. So it was, pre- it was pretty powerful. In that same step of mm-hmm. making amends, did you have a conversation with your parents? Definitely. That was, they were one of the, my parents and my sisters were some of the first amends that I made. They came and visited me in rehab and those were hard conversations. There was a lot of tears. Um, but as they said, then they said the biggest thing you can do, cause they always tell you, what can I do to make it right? And the thing that all of them said was, don't give up on the steps and don't, don't let what a lot of addicts do where time passes and they think that wasn't that bad. You know, surely I could have, I can have a drink. I mean, I'll be, I can be like normal people and just have a glass of wine and be done. And that's just for people like me, as the big book says, we're like people who lose their legs. You never regrow new ones. Mm. And so I just have had to live with that every day and go, okay, even though I'm now over 10 years removed from this, one drink is too many and a thousand is never enough. Wow. Mm-hmm. Is the golf ball still gone? Oh yeah. You've never wanted another pill? I would say, er, I would say early in sobriety I had, and and if you're listening to this and you are an, an addict, you know, don't, don't take my story as kind of the, the catch all, if you will. But early in sobriety, there was definitely some days where I felt a twinge towards it. But I would say probably once I got to the point where I was three, four years sober, where that became like how I live life, um, because the 12 steps have become a part of my life and I, I do them on a daily basis, I've managed to stay in this place where I don't wake up and I go, I don't, like I, when I wake up, I don't go, man, I hope I don't drink today. Yeah, right. You know, I know what you mean. It's just, so I just live life. I can go anywhere on planet earth and not think about it, but it's because the program and following Jesus through the 12 steps have become such a natural part of my life. But so, if not for those decisions, right, you would not have just naturally grown out of that right, addiction. Right, right and been the person that you right. are today. Right. Yeah. People don't believe me when I, when they're wrapped up in porn now and they come mm-hmm. to me and talk about it. I'm like, there will, there can come a time mm-hmm. 
when you look at or think about porn and just how ridiculous it is mm -hmm. and you won't think I've got to watch or I've got to, right. in your case, take pills or whatever. You just think how stupid, mm -hmm. like how, what an awful way to waste your life. Mm -hmm. You know, what a totally. joke. Yep. And uh, you can get there, but it doesn't happen mm -hmm. naturally or accidentally. Mm -mm. All right. So um, let's talk uh, real quick about just faith and recovery, mm -hmm. because uh, clearly the big book was written by believers mm -hmm. and has uh, somehow managed to reach people of all kinds of faiths and no real organized faith. Mm -hmm. um, what was your experience as a Christian mm -hmm. coming out of recovery, coming out of drugs and into recovery? Um, mm -hmm. How did that, those worlds intertwine? You know, I feel like it helped me a lot because there's a lot of people that are coming into recovery that are atheists or agnostic and they have a kind of a God concept of, or like an anti-God concept yeah. walking in. And so for me, I just kind of like replaced higher power with, with Jesus. Sure. And then it just, it just made my faith simple. Like, especially in the places where it says faith without works is dead. I immediately read that and go, oh my goodness, that's the book of James, you know, and you start to see scripture come to life through the principles, the confession, the repentance, the honesty. Right. And it just, it gives you a daily program to, to make all of the stuff that I had learned growing up just a lot more simple. So I would say it, it propelled my faith even more, but it also made it super, super simple. Like, Hey, this is what you do every day. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, uh, when you, I mean, coming from a church background, mm -hmm. obviously it helped you through recovery, but get, coming out of recovery and going back to the people mm -hmm. that you grew up with, mm -hmm. did you get any of that sort of what someone might expect you would run into just the kind of judgmental factor from Christians? Yeah, I think there was a lot, there was more lack of understanding. It was kind of like, oh, that's cool. You know, uh -huh. like, and it's, it, it wasn't so much look down their nose at me, but it was kind of like, that's different from me. Like, I don't have any, I used to be baffled by people that could drink a beer and just leave half a beer on the table. Uh -huh. I'm like, what? Like, yeah. And so, but a lot of my Christian friends are like that. And so that's where early in sobriety, as I re-engaged in the church world, I had to figure out and walk my balance in those early delicate days when I'm kind of learning how to walk again, uh -huh. where I had to draw the line. So there were maybe some times where I wouldn't go to a bar if they were all going out to a bar. They're all people that love Jesus, but I just knew this is probably not the wisest place for me to be in. You know, yeah. whereas now, 10 years later, I have lunch with church visitors at a bar almost weekly. And it's it's just part of normal life. Really? It's not even an option. I'm like, I love the food there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> to what extent did you jump? You said you went back into the church life. Mm -hmm. um, how quickly did that happen? And to what extent did you get back involved? It was really, I had gotten, at the end of my three months in rehab, I had two options. They said, a lot of times what they'll do, the thing I loved about my recovery place is everyone that was there was in recovery themselves. So they weren't just reading from a book to you, like they were living it out themselves. Right. And so they offered for me to stay on the staff there or I could also come back to this area in Houston and work for a family friend who owned a janitorial company, which that was a God appointment because he knew I needed humility. Yep. And he starts every one of his, even though the, the plan was for me to be an account manager, he starts all of these account managers at the bottom Brilliant. So, so that they can never have to ask someone that they're supervising to do something that they haven't done themselves. Wow. And so total God thing that, you know, I'd been cleaning toilets <laughs> In the sober, in the sober house, the recovery house, and I just continued cleaning toilets when I got out. And wow. so, um, but as I got out, I knew I needed to re-engage with the church because I knew I needed community. And there were several friends that were a part of one of the singles groups at Second that had really loved me. They came to my graduation uh -huh. from rehab, and I'll never forget this guy's name is Will Bradley. We're still close to this day, and he happened to be teaching the class that week, and he invited me to come hear him teach. And I remember thinking, gosh, I don't want to go back to second. I know I need to get involved in church, but I felt like I owed him a solid because he loved me in a difficult right. place. Yeah. And so I went one week really just intending to appease him and just was met with complete non-judgment actually. So I huh. mean, had friends that like had heard what I went through and they were like, man, we're so glad you're alive. We're so glad you're doing well. 
Uh, we're here to support you. And then almost immediately, they gave me opportunities to serve. So like the guy who was directing the class was like, hey, I need somebody to greet. Are you going to be here every week? Because I want to give you a job. And I was like, me? <laughs> I just stopped using drugs like three months ago. <laughs> okay, sure. So they just gave me a chance to serve. And it was almost like God knew I needed that because I needed something to do to get my mind sure. off myself. And so- How I, old were you at that point? I was 20, let's see, 2000, I'm 36 now. So I was 26, I want to say. Okay. I was 26 years old and jumped headlong working for the janitorial company and then serving at every chance I can for the church. And then- uh, Still like most preacher's kids thinking and swearing you'd never become- Swearing. <laughs> swearing <laughs> I would it. never be in I thought I was going to go work in business now. And now that I'm done with baseball and I'm going to go try to, you know, make climb the money. corporate ladder, make some money, yeah. you know, do great things for the kingdom in that way. And as I started serving for those first couple of months, I started to feel this- tug at my heart. Uh, uh -oh. Yeah. And I'm like, no, nah, this can't be right. <laughs> this can't, I, I mean, literally I used to have people tell me you'd, you'd be a great pastor one day. And I would tell people I will dig ditches before. Uh, I, famous I because, last words. Yep. You never should have said I that. Know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always yep. like to picture God in heaven going, all right, let's test, <laughs> let's test him out. Let's that's see. right. That's yeah. right. So He'll yeah. call our bluff. That's right. He will. Mm. So yeah, I started to serve and, and, started to feel that tug over the the first couple months. And then I remember going and talking to my dad about it. And he wanted certainly to encourage that, but he also didn't want me to feel in any way pressured. Uh -huh. And so he encouraged me to seek out some, some young pastors that were a little bit further down the road than me, but not my dad, you know, yeah. to, to just ask, hey, what does it mean to be called to minister? Like, what does that look like? And there was a guy, several of the young pastors on staff at Second Baptist that just kind of immediately came to mind and I started to seek them out and really started to, to serve. And then I went on a mission trip in November of 2012. And I feel like that's really where the Lord was kind of like, okay, this is what I have for you. I went mm. to Dubai and got to see people come into Christ in one of the most diabolically opposed to the gospel in the world. And yeah. just kind of started to catch fire. But the thing that I was thankful for as I look back on my journey so I did not feel confirmed of that call and then get off the plane from Dubai and have this ministry job offer. Like right. I'm still at my janitorial company, still managing those accounts, still having to clean some toilets. And God was like, okay, if you really feel called, you'll continue to serve me and trust my timing. And so it was another six months before the opportunity ended up pre presenting itself for huh. me to serve in ministry. So, yeah. Yeah. God will make you wait. He will. Be he will. patient. He will. So talk to me about your, uh, your friend, Parker. Yeah. So Parker, I've known him, had, had known him most of my life. His mom was an English teacher at our school mm. and Parker was younger than me. Um, so I think he was around one of my younger sister's age. And, and we, because he was younger than me, we were not super close growing up. But then at one point when I was in Houston, I think I was in ministry and had heard he was kind of on the wagon, off the wagon, mm. and I'd heard he was back on the wagon. That's when we started to become really close again. Really? You and reached out to him or he reached out I to did. you? I did. I reached out to him, said, hey, heard we're cut from the same cloth, would love to hang out. And so we started going to lunch together and talking about the program. I never actually sponsored him, but we talked about recovery and talked about the steps a lot. And Was he so, responsive? Very responsive. Um and said all the right things. Um, but like every addict, there's always this battle oftentimes going on underneath the surface. Unseen mm -hmm. battle. Yeah. yeah. So, and he had a stretch where he was doing really well. I want to say it was probably seven, eight, nine months of sobriety, but then he was trying, if I remember right, he was trying to either get into law school or you know, was in the process of applying. And I'm sure he was feeling a lot of pressure there. Yeah. He was living at home with his folks. And that's where at some point in that process, there was a relapse. And the hard part with an addict is we only see the surface of what's going on. Right. And underneath the surface, it's, you know, way, 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 way worse. Isn't it weird how um, some addicts seem more at risk when they're under a lot of pressure mm -hmm. and others seem more at risk whenever there's no pressure mm -hmm. and they're bored and mm -hmm. idle? Yep. That's, it's a, it's a weird balance. I mean, it's the stress can be something that makes you feel the, the twinge a little bit more, but it's also the idle time that definitely makes you feel it as well. So, so. with, um, 
Yeah, with Parker, mm -hmm. you you feel like the pressure might have pushed him to his limit. Yeah, maybe. I, you know, it's hard to know because that was when he had his final relapse. Um, we were in a season where we weren't talking. It wasn't intentional, but we weren't talking a whole lot. And sure. I, part of it was, I just thought he was doing great. And yeah. I, mean, I thought uh, last time we had talked, he was getting ready for law school. And my mom and his mom were really close. They're, they kind of all had a support group for knuckleheaded sons, basically, yeah. um, you know, sons that are in recovery. And, and so, um, I just thought he was doing better. And then the next thing I know, we get a call one night that his parents had found him dead in his bathroom. So, overdose. Overdose. Yeah. It was a, Parker was a heroin addict. And so, mm. yeah, it was, that was something that, but, and that was a very surreal thing because we wanted to help their family not have to deal with the aftermath of that. And so me and my dad went up to his room and cleaned out his room. And oh. there I am, you know, I'm probably five, six, seven years sober and I'm, you know, picking up pill bottles, but like, you know, and throwing them away and having these flashbacks of my pill bottles. Oh my gosh. But also like having, being in this weird space of like, just completely un like not feeling any twinge towards it. Like yeah. I like remember thinking back going, me six years ago, I would be opening this up and trying to find one last pill or be scrambling around on the floor trying to find one last pill. And now I'm just completely free. And it was just a weird, it was almost like God was speaking this like, yeah. this could have been you, Russ. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's the other part of it mm -hmm. is that it could have been you. Mm -hmm. could have been your room. Totally. And I, it was a very sobering moment for me and a reminder that you never stop working the steps and you have to treat it like your life depends on it every day. When you are in recovery and you've had a touch point like that with someone who's struggling and then mm -hmm. they make this decision mm -hmm. and they're gone, mm -hmm. do you struggle with shame or guilt for not being a better friend or whatever? You know, yes and no. Um, I also know because I'm in recovery myself, it's something that I had to take ownership of. And so you know, I know that at some point or another, every addict has to do that same thing for themselves. Like they yeah. can't have, they can't have their hand held through the entire program. In you fact, know. you can almost do more harm if you try to totally. hold their hand. Totally. I have a friend in Kansas City who um, was my best friend when I lived there mm -hmm. for a lot of those years, um, but he had a heroin problem. Mm. And I was so green. I didn't even know I wouldn't know heroin if it was sitting right in front of me. Yeah. Probably I still wouldn't. Yeah. But I know some of the terminology now. Mm -hmm. I know he loved eight balls, for example. Yep. Yep. And um, I knew where all of his dealers lived by the time, you know, I was well acquainted with his addiction cycle and getting those calls. I was his call person, I guess, from the hospital because mm -hmm. they would call me when he had overdoses. Wow. And I would go and, you know, he had flatlined at least once. Wow. And um, it's just so... It's just, obviously, it shakes you. It does. You just feel, not only do, is the addict powerless, you as the one who loves an addict feel powerless mm -hmm. over their addiction and, totally. and their self-destructive choices. And totally. I don't know that there's any across-the-board right answer for mm -hmm. people that want to love someone well. No, it's, it's a hard place because you have to point them to the, the things that help, the timeless principles of the program of AA, yeah. It cracks me up when people say, oh, I've tried AA and it didn't work. It's yeah, like, what, what do you think when they say that? I hear that a lot. Yeah, I just, I think, well, at some point they stopped working it. It's my personal take on it. That's how I feel when somebody says, I hate church. Yeah. I tried church once, right. I didn't like it. Right. Like, well, where'd you go? Right. You it's, know, you picked a bad church. Right, totally. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's right. It's what it picked a place that doesn't love people well. and Or, or you just didn't really apply yourself. Totally. Yeah, there, there's an element of, our faith that requires a response on our part, you right? Know, not, not for our, obviously not for our salvation, but sure. for our continued pursuit. That's, that's on us. Right. So yeah. When people say I tried AA and it didn't work, it's just, you know, at some point or another, I think it's just a manifestation of their own excuses, their own selfishness in many ways. And, you know, no offense. I know some people get sober independently from AA. They, yeah. they find Christ and that's how they get free. But I know a lot of people that struggle to stay sober. If you look at their life and at some point or another, when they struggle to stay sober, it's because they distance themselves from that community. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's hard. That's a hard truth, mm -hmm. but it applies across the board from mm -hmm. recovery to church, to mm -hmm. relationships, everything. So, um, uh, at what point did you actually 
throw your hat in the ring and become a full-fledged pastor? What it, year was that? It was 2013. So I'd been sober for a little over a year. And that was one of the things. So I never thought I'd end up in ministry, never thought I would work at my home church. And so that that mission trip was November of 2012. Again, I had to work another, serve another six months, kept serving. And then a buddy of mine was the adult sports director at the church there at the time. But he, we were at lunch probably six months before I stepped on staff. And he was, that role is very much kind of like a put your toe in the water for ministry. It's not a full blown, you're not immediately an ordained pastor, uh-huh, but it's very uh-huh. much a pastoral role if you use it that way. So he's doing that job. I'm doing this business job. We're at lunch and I'm like, I'm feeling called to ministry. And he's like, it's funny, I'm in ministry. I really want to do business. He forms a relationship with the guy I was working for independently. And at this lunch, six months before I came on staff at Second, we jokingly just said, man, we should just trade jobs and we'll fix this whole thing. <laughs> so six months later, you without did. without planning it, that's exactly how it played out. He went to the company that I was at. And then immediately once he left, I applied for his job and wow. stepped in staff and, and just started serving. So- how long did you serve at your at the church that you grew up in? So I was there for eight years. Um, I first did the adult sports, and then I did took on the kids sports as well, which very much was kind of just the the pastoral relational presence, trying sure. to use that as a front door vehicle to get families involved that don't already have a church home. And then towards the end of my time there, Dr. Young was kind of in this big rethinking the Woodway campus and really wanting to revitalize the focus on young families. Uh-huh. I was. By that point, I had met my wife when we were on staff there. She was actually the children's director. No way. And that was kind of my last tryout was I went to children's camp as a counselor. And the guy who actually was one of my big mentors was also her boss. And he's kind of trying to give her the nudge about me. And the Uh. first time she apparently laid eyes on me, I had 20 kids around me and I was literally doing the chicken dance. (laughs) And she she was like, that guy's way too goofy for me. Uh. (laughs) So she was not interested at all. We're kind of two ships passing in the night you know, on the same staff, but not really interacting. And then yeah. about two years later, we we hit it off. So no way. Yeah. So we were young married. And then, so Dr. Young moved me into the kind of the young married's pastor role. I guess it was in 2018. Okay. And then I did that and was also, a lot of churches call it their next steps pastor, mm. evangelism pastor. Sure, sure. Uh, so did that. But then early in ministry, I felt like at some point God would have it for me to be a, a senior pastor one day, but yeah. knew I needed to get experience, knew I needed to grow. And then really over the last two or three years, as my wife and I have prayed, we've started to feel that nudge more and more towards that. And, yeah. And then started the process of where we are now. Where are you now? So we're at Sunset Canyon Baptist Church. Uh, it's a it's a mouthful, I know, but uh, it's a great little place. It's in Dripping Springs, Texas, which if you know anything about Texas, that's actually the fastest growing county in the oh, country man, right it's now. it's blowing up. It is. And uh, it's, where, it's a Great little, we're right on 290, have about a little 15 acre plot of land there. And uh, it was a church that was uh, going through a pretty big transition. They had COVID hit and COVID hit churches like that pretty hard. They've oh, been yeah. pretty small. I think at their height, they were 250, 300 attendance wise. And um, so then their previous senior pastor, his wife was the children's director. So when he stepped away, they both stepped away. So it was definitely one of those churches that was, I mean, kind of limping along after yep. COVID as, as so many were in the country. Absolutely. And so we, uh, we had been praying about an opportunity and then kind of discovered the opportunity through a search firm. And at every step of the way that we prayed for clarity, we just kept praying, God, if this isn't right, shut the door. Mm. And it was like thing after thing, like to the point of the chairman of the pastor search committee his, him and his wife's first young couples group was at Second Baptist 20 years ago. Wow, and small world. Totally small world. He remembered me. And so every step of the way, we felt like God was just leading us out there. And then I guess a year ago, this Sunday is when I went out to preach in view of a call. And then was as good old Southern Baptist church, they vote on everything. So yep, yep. Uh, we they voted, voted, which I know a lot of churches will vote on their senior pastor. But then we started in July of last year and have hit the ground running. So it's been- wow. a, Huge adjustment, but it's also been one of the most rewarding things we've gotten to be a part of. So I can imagine. So the um, the whole time you've been in various roles, pastoral mm-hmm. ministry, have, have you found that you have this inordinate number of opportunities or this crazy opportunity to use your story to reach other people who are struggling with addiction? Mm-hmm. That's probably been one of my biggest ministry opportunities. And even people who don't, 
that's part of why I am so open about it is because, I mean, you know this in church, people that are far from God have this perception of the way church people are. Yeah. And so I try to lead with that because I want them to see, hey, we're all broken. We're all imperfect. We yeah. just follow a perfect savior and we're not perfect people. And so sure. I, both addicts and alcoholics and then non-addicts and alcoholics, I feel like God has used my story uh, in a huge way. And I, I feel like it's shaped my, my, I feel like my primary spiritual gift is evangelism. Yeah. And I think in some ways it's, I know that the Holy Spirit gives us gifts independently of what we go through, but I also feel like my story has helped me to be more confident in sharing my faith because I know what it feels like to grapple faith and to grapple yeah. you know, struggling and all Do you find things. that it helps people trust you more or does it put people's guards up when, when you talk about your past with... It depends. If it's someone who's far from God, I think they trust me more. Like we actually have a couple guys that are helping us start an AA meeting at our church. Wow. And they're not, they're 12 steppers, but they're not believers. And which I was, and then one of them came to church this past Sunday, which I was fired up about yeah. that. And, it's a uh, matter of time, baby. Oh, totally. <laughs> and I, but he's he's just been so interested in the fact that I am so full blown twelve steps. I'm a pastor, yeah. But I'm also very open about my recovery. So for someone like him, I think there's definitely a an endearment. But then church people sometimes get the wide eyed, you know, like yeah. oh, whoa, you know, right. So, yeah. but um, most most non believers, I think, are more attracted to that than sure turned away. I know there's one couple in particular that someone on our team, maybe Julie mm -hmm. or Andrea, have talked to you about. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much we can share about them, but yeah, they're they're um, very open about it. So yeah, we can so, share as much as we want to. Yeah, uh, the guy. Yeah, Luke. Luke. Mm -hmm. um, on and off the the wagon, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, struggling with, I don't know exactly what the addiction is, but it's mostly alcohol. But he's also, I think he would say, he's one of those kind of whatever changes the way you feel. So. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Sure. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us about your experience with them. And so, I, yeah, and I'm actually sponsoring him now. Oh, uh, wow. Awesome. Yeah, I started taking him under my wing and walking him through the steps, but he just got out of, he went to recovery for a month and just got out. And his fiance is also in recovery as well. Oh, wow. And she's actually, it's, it's interesting. She's a recovered heroin addict, but then about 18 months ago, she realized I got to quit everything because she, yeah. she was still trying to, to drink. So she's, 18 months clean from everything. And so, but they're actually kind of at a place where she's very supportive of him, but they were engaged and I guess in some senses technically are, but they're kind of taking a time out and yeah. some space there just to first let things him first. totally. And that's where I've been able to help encourage him. I'm like, listen, if you're not right with your recovery, you're never going to be able to be a fiance and then eventually a husband, a dad, I had the chance to speak into that because I told him one of the biggest things that drove me towards sobriety was obviously number one, knowing that was God's best for my life. And number two, I wanted a family yep. and I knew I was never going to have the kind of family I wanted living how I was living. But you can fool yourself. I've seen people fool themselves into uh, replacing alcohol or mm -hmm. something with um, romantic relationship. Yep, totally. And because that changes how they feel. Totally. Just like alcohol. Totally. Right. But only for a little while. Right. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work out yep. for mm -hmm. very long. Mm -hmm. People can do that too. It's and and Dr. Lemke talked about this really? too. She was like, people get hung up on addictions being about the substance. Mm -hmm. It's really more. It's really more about um, the why mm -hmm. and the as you mentioned the the stack of trash in the back of your truck, totally. like the unmanageable totally. aspect of it. That's really how we should be defining addiction. Totally. And uh, and how we're doing. Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, grasp or concept about why it's harder for some people than others about like staying sober? I have some theories. You know, I'd be curious what Dr. Lemke thinks on this, but I look at a lot of my friends that have struggled to stay sober and not all of them, but the vast majority of them fell into it at a very young age, like mm. got drunk when they were 11 years old and were like, this is awesome. Maybe fell upon some friend's liquor cabinet or whatever I was fortunate that I had 19, 20 years of life without it. Yeah. And so now I don't know if there, I, I think there's probably some science that supports this because you're going through such formational stuff in your brain. And at yeah. the same time, you're getting drunk or getting high on pills during that season. And so a lot of my friends that struggle to stay sober, they don't have a whole lot of recollection of what life was like without it. Mm. So I, I think there's some level of that. And that's why it's, the steps are important for all of us, but I think they're especially important for those that just 
fell into it at a really young age. So then I have to ask, man, yeah. cause like probably more than half the families at our churches mm -hmm. have at least one kid who's mm -hmm. been prescribed some stuff mm -hmm. similar to what you were messed mm -hmm. up with later mm -hmm. in life. What do you tell parents that ask you in confidence? Like, yeah. should we do this for our, usually our son? Yeah, totally. Our kid. Yeah. It's, I mean, if they have a really tight rein on it, I will say part of it for me, so I didn't start taking Adderall until I was a young right. adult. And yeah. so some, at least with Adderall, a lot of times it's actually the opposite. If they're exposed to it as in like, hey, this is your vitamin basically uh -huh. as at a young age, they may end up struggling with some other form of addiction. But a lot of times, at least specifically with Adderall, they're just kind of used to that being almost their daily vitamin. Not always. Sometimes they discover later in life that if you take more than you're prescribed, you can get really, really high on it. Yeah. But um, I've just found a lot of people that if they are exposed to it at a young age, as long as it's managed well and they're not abusing it now, pain pills and other stuff like that, that's a whole different ball game. Yeah, so, sure. It's just uh, got to be real careful, right? With totally. Your parents. Totally. Um, because it does, these yeah. medications yeah. do good things. Totally. Uh, but it's so delicate. Right. Such a thin line. And that's where I always encourage, I mean, I'm just kind of a fan of, if you don't have to do it, you sh you don't need to. But I also know there are some kids that legitimately need it. That yeah. if they're not, like there, there's a brain chemistry issue and all that. And that's where I'm not well trained enough as a doctor to know one way or another. Right. But, you know, I always encourage parents to ask the question, is it just a way to just kind of get the problem fixed? Or is it something that like, there's major, major, major behavior problems. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if they don't have that. Are there general sort of things you tend to tell families, loved ones of addicts when they come to you worried, sick about, mm -hmm. you know, just like your parents were at a time mm -hmm. when they were wondering with every phone call, like, is this the is this one? Mm -hmm. uh, what do you tell people generally? Yeah, I just say you got to tell them the truth. And you, I always make sure they take a hard look to make sure they're not enabling them. A lot of times they're trying in an effort to love them, but they're letting them stay in their house for free. And, mm. you know, the car is paid for by the parents and they're yep. getting an allowance. And it's like, dude, you're 26 years old and you have a college degree, like get a job and you sleep <laughs> until 11 o'clock. I mean, but we think it's love. Right, totally. So, I mean, they've, they've got, I mean, that was part of what I helped me because my parents gave me the option. They said, you either need to get clean and go to rehab or basically we're cutting you off. Like you'll mm. never stop being our son, but we're not going to support this any longer. Really? And so they, that, stood, they, they stood their ground. Stood their ground. And it's the, the scary part was I still had a decent chunk of money that I could have run to the ground. And so I know a lot of addicts do that, but I just knew how desperate it was for me personally. But a lot of families and a lot of kids never get to that point because they never are faced with the reality of the consequences of their decisions. They right. have the soft landing bed as opposed to hitting rock bottom. So you're a, you're a proponent of the rock bottom. Totally. Theory. I'm like, man, make it hurt. Mm, yeah. It's funny. Dr. Lemke kind of uh, alluded thing. to the same. Yeah. She said actually financial ongoing financial support mm -hmm. with no consequences, yep. you know, for bad behavior or anything yep. like that. Like, that, that is in many ways the worst thing you can do. Totally. For someone. Totally. But it's so, it's way easier said than done. Oh, totally. Because when you got somebody you love who's barely hanging on by a thread. Totally. And you think pulling financial support from them might be what sent them over the edge. Totally. It's real easy for your heart to overcome your mind. Right. Mm -hmm. and start to think, well, what if I contribute to mm -hmm. their ultimate demise? Mm -hmm. It's rough. It is rough. It's a hard place to be and makes me, um, you know, look back and not thrilled about what I put my parents through, but mm. grateful that God had his hand on me. You know, what's wild talking about God is I've noticed sin works like addiction, mm -hmm. like writ large, right? Yep. Generally speaking, I right. just think when, when you look at how people struggle with sin, generally, mm -hmm. we've got a few things we call addiction, right? right? But like sin, that's just what sin does. Right. And it behaves in the same patterns. And if we, that's why I think the big book is for everyone. I, I agree. think everyone could learn a lot from it. Totally. Um, but it really, when we talk about how grueling it is to love an addict, mm -hmm. it really gives you a window into the heart of God mm -hmm. and how <laughs> it must, I, I don't know if God has feelings like we have feelings, but mm -hmm. Bible talks a lot about, you know, what, what God endures to love us. Totally. 
And, um, you know, loving one addict is one thing. Loving eight billion of us at a mm-hmm. time. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. got to be another. Totally. And, uh, and yet his, you know, the promise of scripture cover to cover mm-hmm. is that his love endures. Mm-hmm. And that his love poured out on the cross mm-hmm. is more than enough to cover our iniquities mm-hmm. and to make amends in a way on our behalf, if that totally. makes sense, but to bridge that gap. Totally. And when you love an addict and you see the pain of that, it's, it really is eye opening. It is. And about it's how much God must really be love. Totally. And it, it, it's that whole verse in second Corinthians, he who knew no sin became sin. Mm-hmm. So not only did he, bear it, but he literally became it for us. And and it was almost like he assumed every one of those things for us. Why? So that we could become the righteousness of God. Right. He can look at us as pure. He didn't, he didn't pay our bills in a way that made our life easy. Right. Um, He made, he, he paid our bill in a way that set us free from shame. That's right. But he still invites us to suffer, Mm -hmm. which is interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. And that kind of goes with what you're saying about loving addicts well. Mm -hmm. Like we need to invite each other to suffer. Totally. And just to sit with the nothingness Mm -hmm. when we're coming clean Mm -hmm. and be willing to have withdrawal symptoms and Mm -hmm. sit through it. I'm talking about addicts, you know, but I mean all of us to be able to to sit in our sin, Mm -hmm. understand what Jesus came to do. Mm -hmm. And even if it hurts, stay faithful another day. That's right. Right? That's right. And um, when we want it to feel good all the time, like we thought the church told us, a lot of us grew up in churches where like, yeah, of course God wants you to be happy. And right. if you're not, you're like, well, I, why not do these things that make me feel happy? Right, totally. We're supposed to feel happy. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's the worst thing. That's right. For us. We're, supposed, right. to, we're supposed to embrace pain, struggle, mm-hmm. even suffering, mm-hmm. and stay faithful anyway. That's right. And that's... Uh, I think that's what Jesus came to do for us. I agree. Uh, Russell, man, thank you for um, spending more time than I asked you for <laughs> with us. Thanks for having me. It's, that's You're how very... it works with pastors. We we get talking and two hours go by. Oh, man. And, <laughs> and I am going to be praying for you and your thank church. You. And means a lot. Um, I am. I told you earlier, I was never the greatest baseball player, but I'm a, I'm a huge baseball fan. That's awesome. And I did uh, look you up. How many, so see if you remember this, how many professional home runs did you hit i think it was only like 10 it's exactly 10 was it really yeah, yeah. not a great career Good average guess. it was like 238 hey man <laughs> i didn't look at the average the batting average is a false statistic that's right no it is it what is. was your war that's the <laughs> that was before they tracked war right, which i'm right. glad because it was probably not good <laughs> it was probably in the positive numbers <laughs> i hope so maybe. I hope so. Yeah, 10 I home it. runs and, uh, you know it was it was not bad it's yeah. more than i have yeah that's it, it was it was something you're, you, look, you, for a moment, were a professional baseball right. player. I got, I got paid to play. Bro. Not many kids can say that. Dream come true. That's right. And then you fell on some hard years, mm-hmm. but God's faithful. He is faithful indeed. And you said yes to his faithfulness. Mm-hmm. And now he's living through you mm-hmm. and you. using your story to change lives, bro. Thank you. Is there anything better? No, nothing better than that. Isn't it better? That, even if you had won the College World Series or mm-hmm. gotten that call to the big leagues. Mm-hmm. It's, I tell people that all the time. I wouldn't, if even if the Astros called and said, Hey, we want to sign you, I'd say, I'm sorry, I'm right in the middle of really? God's will. I'm I mean, not sure depends. I would say. Yeah, it depends. I mean, if they want to, you know, help boost our, our giving for a little while, there then you, you go. Know. There you go. What's the tithe on the minimum That's right, salary? Exactly. <laughs> Thank y'all for uh, for tuning into this uh, YouTube channel and uh, be sure to like this video if you enjoyed this conversation with Russell Dixon and uh, subscribe to Maybe God's YouTube channel so you can uh, get notified. Be sure to hit that bell, right? So you can uh, be notified of all our new content that uh, is sure to be coming out pretty soon. Thank you all so much. And uh, Russell, thank you again for being with us, man. Thanks for having me.